worst thing we've done as a human race, won't we? <laughs> You want me to you want me to move just move that over? Good evening, everyone. We're so glad you're here. Thank you and welcome. I'm Rhonda Phillips, Dean of the Purdue Honors College, and we're just, again, delighted that you joined us tonight for the fifth annual Aronson Family Science and Society Lecture Series. We have members of the Aronson Family here right with us, so I just want to take a moment and thank you again for all the support. So let's give a little round of applause. <laughs> They have made this possible every year, and uh, last year, of course, we, we had to go, uh, well, we couldn't do much because of the pandemic, but this year, here we are, live, in person. It feels so good to be back and to see you all here, and to uh, certainly welcome our very special guest speaker, who I'll get to in just a moment. Um, I wanted to thank the uh, Aronson family again for generous support and also our co-sponsor, Purdue's new Institute for Climate, Environment, Food, and Sustainability. And of course, all of you coming out on a Monday night. And we are an interdisciplinary college that or de is devoted to lifelong learning, encourage curiosity, and trying to uh, help people have that love of learning that will carry them forward while they're here in college and beyond. And so I'm particularly happy about this idea of looking at the intersection of science and society. What do we learn? What do we need to know as members of communities and societies from science and what can it teach us? And tonight's topic is particularly relevant because we're talking about diversity of how we grow our food, our crop diversity, and all those things related to that. And so you'll learn a lot tonight and we encourage you to uh, ask questions and uh, to participate and be part of this, and so we're very happy to do that. Now let me tell you a little bit about our special speaker, Dr. Allison Power. She is from Cornell, so she's visiting us, and she said we're not as cold as where she came from, so that's, that's a really good thing about being in Indiana. And uh, she is a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology. She is a central figure in the field of disease ecology, conservation, and sustainable development. She has provided extensive knowledge on, on disease ecology in plant communities across the U.S., Central America, and Africa, and in Southeast Asia. She leads a research group on the, natural, the roles of natural enemies and mutualists in plant invasions at the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. And she serves as Vice President for Public Affairs for the Ecological Society of America. She also serves as the Presidential University Fellow of the Nature Conservancy, and there's, there's a group that, that works with uh, the public at large as well. And on the Committee on California Agricultural Research Priorities of the Natural Research Council. Now tomorrow she's going to be visiting honors classes. She's going to be meeting with a journal club. And, and that this latter event is with honors students who have been engaging with her public work. And it's going to be led by our very own honors college alum, Mark Aronson. So, so there's a chance for you current students to meet one of your graduates uh, from uh, several years ago and learn about his work as well. So we're going to get started hearing about crop diversity. It's incredibly interesting. It's something that affects us all. And why is that? Because we all like to eat. So join me in welcoming Dr. Allison Powers. Thank you. 
Thanks so much for that introduction. I really appreciate it. It's been a really fun visit so far here to Purdue, where I've never been, and it's not as cold as Ithaca. Just remember that, even when it's chilly out. So today I want to talk about crop diversity uh, and its use by smallholder farmers. Um, but before I do that, I just want to say something about where I come from. Um, I'm an ecologist. I was trained as an ecologist. I grew up partly in Alaska and in Washington State. And so I was one of those people that actually wasn't very interested in agriculture. You know, it wasn't something that really struck me uh, until I started traveling around the world a little bit. And then I started noticing how agriculture really changes the landscape. And there are places that are, you know, what I was interested in at the time, which was sort of, oh, all those diverse systems um, that you could find in the tropics, they were not very available because they had been modified extensively by agricultural systems. So that's kind of my entry into agriculture. I didn't come in, I didn't grow up on a farm, I didn't have that kind of experience in my background. Um, but what I did do, whoops, that worked too, oh good, everything works. <laughs> um, but what I did, what I was interested in uh, was the sort of levels of diversity that you find in natural ecosystems and so as you're all aware that some of the most biodiverse uh, systems on Earth are the tropical rainforests. This is taking its own, making its own changes. Um, uh, and, uh, and as we go down this little triangle, you can see that diversity goes down as we go down from tropical forests to temperate forests to natural grasslands. Boreal forests, which I knew very well when I lived in Alaska, were, are not very diverse, especially with respect to tree species. Um, and then at the very bottom, Spartinum marshes and, and geothermal pools are extremely not diverse, right? What's interesting is if you look at agriculture, you can actually find a similar kind of gradient. So if you look at um, shifting cultivation in tropical forests, now a lot of people you know, another word for that is slash and burn agriculture, and a lot of people think, oh, slash and burn, that's not a good thing. But in fact, in the way that it has been practiced for thousands of years, um, this shifting cultivation worked quite well. You, you cropped a particular area of land, you then let it go fallow and move to another area of land. The overall diversity in the system was maintained completely because you weren't, um, you know, eliminating anything at the time. So that, I would argue, is actually a very diverse system, but land pressures, population growth have put pressure on that style of agriculture. We also see tropical home gardens are very um, diverse. What people grow around their, their house can be super diverse. Um, poly, then we move down to things that are probably more familiar to at least some of you, polycultures or intercrops, where you have two or more species growing together on the same plot of land, and smallholders use that um, you know, globally to, to uh, improve their agricultural systems. And then if we keep going down, we see varietal mixtures where you have maybe two varieties that you're mixing together, and I'll actually talk about some of those uh, today. Uh, and then as you go down into different crops, you find that some are more diverse than others in terms of their genetic diversity. So, Wheat varieties uh, tend to be open pollinated, and therefore um, they have a lot of a fair amount of mixing of genetic material. Maize hybrids are much narrower because you're putting them on a on a um, you're breeding two inbred lines, so you have some diversity, but not uh, as much as a as a wheat plant. And then you have clonal crops like banana is grown as a clonal crop, but also potatoes. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever grown potatoes in your backyard, but you Cut open a potato and you take the and you you take an eye. You have to have an eye and then you plant that um, eye and it grows a potato. So you have a lot of uniformity in the crop because it's clonal the way that you propagate it. So I'm forgetting which I get to do that. Oh, that didn't work. Okay, so. I want to start by talking a bit about genetic diversity. That's sort of the most basic kind of diversity that we see in crops. But what you can see here from these two um, 
examples. Uh, one is maize from Mexico, and I just gave you two different photos displaying the beautiful diversity that you see in, these, uh, in this corn from, maize, uh, from Mexico. And similarly with the potatoes, um, this comes from Peru, and it actually, this bottom one, is a single field of, uh, of potatoes with all these different varieties of potatoes in the field. And this is one I really like. This, this one was um, called, in Quechua, the local language, was called the potato that makes the mother-in-law cry. And it's because, <laughs> because when you peel it, it's so hard to peel with these deep, deep eyes. Okay? So, you know, there's a super amount of diversity, and these are obviously from smallholder systems. You wouldn't see that kind of diversity. Well, we're in Iowa. Or no, we're in Indiana, sorry. We're in one of the I states. <laughs> Somebody was talking about I states today. Um, we're in Indiana, so you know corn here, and you're not gonna find that kind of diversity in a single field in, in corn, obviously. So, I want to just mention a few kinds of diversity. I'm not going to talk about all of them in my talk the rest of the time, but I just want to mention that we have these different levels of diversity. We have different ways of managing agriculture that take advantage of these different kinds of diversity. So for example, we have crop genetic diversity that I just talked about. We have crop species diversity uh, in polycultures. So here's a mixture of the potato varieties I just talked about. There are like seven um, varieties present here. Here we have seven species present uh, in an intercrop, uh, and people still grow food that way in many parts of the world. Um, here we have, over here, we have structural diversity. Oh, and then there, oh, sorry, there are other kinds of uh, crop species diversity. These polycultures, cover crops. People who use cover crops are effectively using an intercrop in their system. Um, flowering strips that people put up for pollination to attract pollinators and even repellent plants. Some people plant marigolds around parts of their garden to repel plants. So those are essentially all um, species, crop species diversity built into the system. Okay, so now structural diversity. So agroforestry where you grow uh, crops between trees and here's um, shade plantations like shade coffee. You know, you can go out and buy shade coffee, right? Pay a little more to, to buy it from someplace that is keeping the shade over the coffee. Uh, and there's also shade cacao for chocolate. Um, and then you have, as I mentioned before, home gardens, which are extremely diverse. So these are all um, types of structural diversity that you find in different agroecosystems. And then we also have landscape diversity, which is what I'm showing you here, again from Peru. But what you can see is this is a mosaic of different crops. It's not uniform. It's, um, it has a bunch of different crops grown in small little parcels because that's all driven by the, the social system that allows people parcels at different uh, levels of altitude so that they can grow their frost resistant crops at the top and other things that need more um, temperature, warmer temperatures farther down. So it's, it's deliberate that way, but it has this functional the function of actually um, diversifying the system, which means you're likely to get less pests and pa particularly pests moving uh, through the system because it's diverse and the pests can't find their hosts. So these agroecosystems, what I want to really impress upon you is that, and I come from ecology where I'm, you know, where I started out studying wild things rather than domesticated things, but these are really managed ecological systems, and we have to think of them that way. Um, they're products of human experimentation. People have been experimenting on all these agricultural systems for hundreds of years, thousands of years. So there's a lot of, of knowledge that's built up about these systems. Um, they're shaped by all these constraints, and any farmer knows a lot of these things are constraining what uh, a particular farm can grow at a particular place. It's all place-based. Um, and so climate, soil, water, land, labor, technology, capital markets, all those things affect what a given farmer might grow. And that's true, obviously, in agriculture here in the United States as well as agriculture uh, uh, around the world. And I want to emphasize that 
you know, these things, these systems aren't static. They're heterogeneous and context dependent, but they're also dynamic and adaptive. And so they respond to changes and, and humans respond to the, to the changing conditions in a way that helps them adapt to whatever's coming. Now, that, there are limits to that, I will say. So in the context of climate change, one can't make that statement for everything. Um, but they also exhibit complex interactions among all the components of the system. So I'm going to focus the rest of my talk today on um, the Ethiopian farmers' use of crop diversity and two aspects of it. I'm going to talk about varietal diversity within legume species, and I'm going to talk about varietal and species mixtures in cereal crops. You can see that. So Ethiopia has a really long history uh, of, of being recognized as a center of diversity, including for, for a lot of legume crops and also for some other crops. I haven't listed all the crops that might be relevant. So, but chickpea, cowpea, field pea, grass pea, faba bean, fenugreek, lentil, these are all, some of them you probably haven't ever eaten, but they're all legumes that uh, have one of their centers of diversity uh, is in Ethiopia. And for smallholder farmers in Ethiopia, these legumes provide a lot of really important functions, serve a lot of functions that are really important. Their food, obviously protein, we, anybody here who's a vegan or a vegetarian is going to probably be eating beans to get protein, uh, but they also feed them uh, to their uh, animals, so they serve as forage or fodder for animals. They, they improve soil fertility because, of course, legumes are nitrogen fixing. They take atmospheric nitrogen and turn it into something that's usable by plants. That means when those plants, when you have, um, uh, when you have those plants in the field, they're contributing nitrogen locally. And then they also provide cash income because people eat a lot of legumes in, in Ethiopia. And so that they can sell that for cash to use to buy, to buy the things they need that, that they can't grow, which of course there are lots of those. So I, I want to emphasize, though, that leg, legume diversity has even more, uh, more import. I mean, that was just different, you know, legumes provide these things. But the diversity part provides dietary quality. So you have this diversity of legumes that, that have different amino acids, slightly different configurations of the proteins. Uh, they have broader temporal av av uh, availability uh, throughout the year because they mature at different times. and so and you're, they get harvested at different times, so you have access to them at different times, and so you have this temporal availability that changes, and they really can, can contribute to adaptive capacity and resilience in a way that, um, because of their nitrogen contributions to all parts of the system, the soil, the animals, the plants, that can buffer changes that might be encountered by other kinds of stressors in the system, and of course, we tend to constantly be when we think of stressors, we're often thinking of climate stressors. Uh, and the other thing, last but not least on my list, uh, is food culture. So Ethiopian food culture really takes advantage of this diversity of legumes, this long traditional diversity of legumes. And if you've ever gone to an Ethiopian restaurant, do they have any here? No, okay, well, we actually have one in Ithaca, which is kind of remarkable because we're smaller than, <laughs> than your towns, but, um, but they will serve this diversity of legumes because that's part of the culture. And I'll show you a good picture of that in a minute. So there are things that we don't know about legumes in Ethiopia, though. We know they're diverse. We know that farmers grow them and eat them, and everybody eats them. Um, but nobody's really been monitoring the status of these, and so the significance of legume diversity for farmers has really been understudied there, as it has been probably lots of places in the world. Um, and the effects of agricultural development policies are kind of difficult to anticipate. There have been, I'll, I'll mention one later, that has kind of skewed things a little bit with respect to the, the production of, of legumes. But there are lots of reasons why it would be good to know more about why farmers are growing this diversity of legumes and what are they valuing in those crops that they're growing. 
I mean, I just told you the ways that I think that they can be useful to farmers, but we want to also, we wanted also to hear that from farmers. This is part of a collaborative project uh, that we developed with, okay, come on. Oh, there we go. Um, what we called a really original name, the Legume Diversity Project, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, but it, the idea was to build a knowledge base about the diversity of farmers' traditional legumes in Ethiopia. Uh, and we collaborated um, with five Ethiopian universities, Cornell and then the five others. And I'll, at the end, I will show you exactly what, um, which ones they are, but these are the five, the little symbols on the map show where they are. So they're distributed all over the country. That means they're in different agroecological zones. They're, um, they have different weather patterns because Ethiopia, if you don't know this, is a very mountainous country, so the weather really moves around quite dramatically in some cases. Um, and we ran a program for two years in which we brought in masters and PhD students. Most of them were from agronomy or botany. Uh, we did have some people that were entomologists in the program as well. And we had plant pathologists as well in the program. So agriculture students, um, but as well botany students. Um, and the idea was to bring them together, provide some training, and, and focus on farmers' traditional values. Oh, no wonder it didn't seem to be working for me. Okay, thank you. Um, so the way that we designed um, the trainings that we did were to bring in these students. Now, they're already master's or PhD students uh, in their home university, so they've already taken the biology, the basic biology courses, the botany courses, the agronomy courses. We really focused on um, helping them understand um, the value of talking to farmers because in many parts of the world, um, some of the disciplines of agriculture have sort of moved away from interacting very much with farmers. You know, you, you have a breeding program that's not necessarily working with the farmers. It's breeding for good traits that you think are important, but they're not necessarily um, trying things out with the farmers and learning what farmers are, really want out of the system. I mean, everybody wants higher yields, so that's a given, but there's many other traits that farmers are interested in, we discovered. So anyway, we, uh, we started um, training uh, before the field work. We talked to them about principles of agroecology because a lot of them had not had that, also, although some had. Uh, we also talked about integrating indigenous and scientific knowledge, and that was really one of the big points of what we were doing, was trying to um, encourage people who had scientific training to consider how indigenous knowledge might really contribute to their understanding of any given topic that we were talking about, and in this case, legume diversity. Um, we, we talked to them about research ethics, you know, in terms of if you're taking, if you're going out and talking to people, any, any university in the U.S. requires an IRB, an Institutional Review Board, approval of, you know, talking to people and taking their information and how you're going to treat it, how you're going to make it anonymous, all, all those things, so people aren't hurt in any way by giving you uh, the information that, that they're giving you. So we, taught, we, we worked on research ethics. We worked on interview methods, um, both quantitative, so we did surveys that were quantitative, but we also did qualitative surveys just to get um, the farmers' opinions about things, about how the system was working. Um, and we also, um, we did digital data collection through this program called Open Data Kit so that people could go out with a cell phone and collect the data and already have it digitized. And that was um, important. There, you know, there'd be no place for them to hook up a computer to download their, their written stuff, but in most places they could get access to a cell phone um, tower. And that's actually true in many countries in Africa that they've never had uh, any kind of internet connection until they could get on a cell phone. And once they got cell phones, so cell phones are everywhere because they're actually the best way of communicating. No, no, no hard line telephones. Of course, none of you know what a hard line telephone is anymore, but I used to use one. Um, and then we also um, trained them, you know, started training them if they hadn't used it before in geographic information systems. Oh, and I want to point out that Open Data Kit and QGIS are both 
open source, so they don't have to pay to get the programs, which is really essential if you're working in that environment. And so we, everything we did with um, software, we made sure it was open access software. So then, we, so then the students went out and spent months and months out talking to farmers. I wish I'd put in the picture of one of them. Somebody, he was so tired from climbing. He was in a very mountainous region, and so somebody gave him a mule to ride. And so, they, you know, he's, he's almost taller than the mule, but there he was. At least he had something to ride while he was going up and down these mountains, these very steep mountains. But they went out and did this field work. It was amazing. Each student uh, interviewed 144 different farm households and got all this, went through these long, relatively long interviews about the, the um, species that they were growing, the species they were using. I'm only going to give you one or two of their results today because it would take me all day, but they learned a lot from these farmers. And many of these students, they came from farming communities, but they'd gone to town and gone to university, and they weren't necessarily aware of all the things, even in their home communities, that might be important to farmers. So a lot of them said that they really learned a lot from the process and they were going to continue um, making sure that they were actually learning from farmers as they went forward. Then we brought them back for a second training the next year after, after they were finished with their field work. And in that case, we worked on data management and visualization, statistical analysis in R, which again is a free program, open program, um, and then writing scientific papers. We've continued to assist them um, with preparing manuscripts for publication and assistance with the publishing process. Um, and so many of them, especially from the first cohort, have already published papers on their on their research with the farmers. So they all focused on different, variety, or different legumes and in different places and maybe with some different specific interests. And so um, that's been, in my view, quite a success. Um, I just wanted to point out my two postdocs that um, worked on this project who have really been instrumental in making it all work because I didn't stay and I, could, I went every year for a few weeks, but they would go uh, for long periods and really um, assist the students and also get out in the field and kind of ground truth a lot of things. So Morgan Rall, who's now a faculty member at Clark University, and Alex McElvey, who is now a curator at the New York Botanical Gardens, and, and they're both continuing to do this work in Ethiopia, which is great. And this is some of our groups of students and what they're doing, as you see. So, let's see, oh yeah, next slide, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I keep clicking it, thinking I have it. So I, I want to emphasize that we used a fairly rigorous approach to come up with common protocols so that all the students are asking exactly the same questions um, to the farmers and recording the um, data in the same way. And we stratified the sampling um, to make sure that we were including different cultural identities and keeping track of that. Because as some of you would know, um, Ethiopia has, um, by one count 86 different languages in it, so that means actually 86 different ethnic groups, uh, some of which are you know, fairly closely aligned, but others are very different. And so just making sure that we actually could track if there were ethnic differences in the use of these varieties. Um, we also looked at agroecological zone because you would predict that different varieties would be grown in different agroecological zones. Higher up in the mountains, some things are, do better, lower down other things do better. Um, gender, we, we talked, we made sure that we stratified by talking to half women and half men um, when we were doing the surveys. And so we have data on, you know, they don't always say the same thing. Um, and so we have data on, on um, their views and their preferences because, you know, that men and women have somewhat different roles in the household, usually, and therefore it matters, you know, who you're asking about certain things. Like, for a lot of Ethiopian men in the countryside, don't ask them about how it, you know, how it cooks. Does it cook, you know, is it a good cooking um, bean or not, or variety or not? They're not going to know the answer to that. So, sorry, I'm not trying to insult any of the men in the audience. Um, uh, and then we did these, we also tried to find, in most communities, we were able to find what we were calling a key informant, meaning somebody who everybody said, this is the person that knows 
everything about the varieties that are in the community. So we would do an open-ended kind of questionnaire with these people to just try and find out you know, what were the attributes of the, of the varieties that were present in the community, um, the m nutritional and medicinal values of different um, crops, and then also the changes, like historically, what were the changes in abundance of those, of those crops. I'm not gonna, again, give you all that data because that would be, you'd be here all night. Um, but just to know that we really tried to cover a lot of bases in, in what we were asking um, people. And thank you. You just see me push the button and then you do it, thank you. Um, so this is, um, it's, got different, it's got different colors in this one. But anyway, this is a different, uh, this is a, a view of varietal diversity per region, per zone is the, is the term that is used in, in um, Ethiopia. But it, it's bigger than a county. It's more, it's a larger piece uh, of the country than a county might be. Um, but, and what we found was a lot of variation between, here are the five crops at the bottom, common bean, faba bean, fenugreek, field pea, and brown nut, in case you didn't know that peanut was a legume. Some people might not. Um, and what you can see is that some crops are incredibly diverse at the regional level. So, so uh, the common beans in both of these zones were you know, 15, well, 16, 18, 20 varieties found uh, in the region. And uh, others were much less diverse, like um, fenugreek in particular. We only found one or two um, in any given zone. We only found one or two varieties of, of fenugreek. But the two different colors here are the purple is something that has been somehow introduced. The, the farmers don't consider it traditional, okay? And, but the thing is, it could be introduced from totally outside, or more likely it's been introduced from another community or another region and coming in that way. So, so it may not be really new to Ethiopia. We can't distinguish that based on what they report to us. Next, please. So, this is just an example, and it's, the, and it's the most diverse system. This is all data collected by one of our students, Bethlehem. Um, and she went out and talked to farmers, and she found um, you know, the most diversity, 19 different um, varieties of common bean uh, in this fairly small zone where she was working down, down here in the southern, uh, southern part. And then uh, we had another student working farther north who found many fewer varieties but still collected quite a few varieties of common bean. And if we look at those, those um, the, you know, what farmers say that these different varieties are good for, I've just picked out four of them to look at. Uh, and basically, if you look at, these used to be, these colors were green <laughs> on my computer. So there's something weird going on with the projector. But so if you look at um, all that really matters is the yellow green versus the red. So uh, the, everything in yellow green is either extremely important, very important, or somewhat important. Uh, and the red is not at all important. And so what you see here is that, is that some varieties are really important for household consumption and, really un and some varieties are really not uh, important for household consumption. Other varieties uh, are not important for income or not very important for income, uh, but they're really, but there are some that are extremely important for income. So their income, getting them from selling them to the market. And the one that stands out is always Netsbaloke, which is this bean that the government has been promoting because it's the bean that Europeans prefer. So their exports are going to, to Europe, and so the government wants, as you would expect, wants to get uh, more foreign currency exchange and wants to bring that into the country, and so they encourage the, the extension agents go out and encourage people to grow this. And so they do grow it for money, but they would never eat it. You know, they, they don't like it. And I have to agree with them. It's not nearly as tasty as many of these other varieties of the ones that I've sampled. Next slide, please. So um, 
coming back to this idea of how many varieties there are of these different species um, and which ones are new and which ones are traditional, what I've added here is that top figure is what I already showed you, how many are available in the zone. And we, you know, again, we can see that common bean over here uh, has a lot available in the zone. I can't see my pointer now. Um, but uh, if you drop down to at the community level and the per household level, what you see is that any given household is only growing one to two varieties of these crops. Okay, so any given year, they're growing one to two varieties, but intermediate between the zone and, and the household is the community level. And so what you see is that at the community level, they're, they're um, for most crops, except for, except for fenugreek, um, uh, they have many more varieties available at the community level than they have that they grow in a single household. And so our interpretation of this is that, is that, um, that they, that if you're trying to focus on, on conserving this genetic diversity in your crops, you want to focus at the community level, not at the, not at the household level. You don't have to convince a given farmer to retain all their, um, all the different varieties that they grow, but what you do want is some understanding at the community level that there are, there are these diversity of, of varieties that are gonna be useful depending on how situations change. And indeed, these, these farmers know that because they plant some varieties one year and some varieties the next year. So maintaining that at the community level we think is probably a really important step rather than the zone which just gets too big um, but if all the communities are engaged in this, they could retain a lot of this. And indeed, there, are, there has been the development in the last five years or so of, of community seed banks where people, farmers bring their seed to this community seed bank and then they can get seed from, if they put seed in, they can get other seed out of the community food banks. And they seem to be working pretty well. Um, at, at least when I could last get to Ethiopia, they were working well. So, Sorry. So one last point I want to make um, is that despite what I just said about cons conserving them at the community level, um, what we see when we look across all the different um, varieties of, all the different areas that have varieties of these legumes is that very few of the varieties are actually being used by a large proportion of farmers, okay? so. The green is the ones that are used by at least two-thirds of farmers in a given community. And most of them are used, uh, you know, medium is up to, is up to one-third, and low use is just does somebody use them. And then what's perhaps most concerning is, and so that's the dominant part of this, is that maybe only, you know, uh, very, very few people use any particular variety and so there's more chance of losing that variety in the system uh, and what's and what's also kind of backs that up is the fact that in almost all of these crops people will tell you oh we used to use that but nobody uses it now and you know no i don't know anybody who actually keeps it anymore so these seem to be varieties that have been lost at least from that region now it's possible that some other region might be using them and that might be to ex be expected if climate is changing in a way that some regions are becoming inhospitable for that particular variety, but other regions are, being, are becoming a better place to grow that variety, but we don't have that information. So it's still concerning to us that there, isn't, there hadn't been sort of a concerted effort to um, conserve this genetic diversity. However, all our students that went to the field got samples of all the varieties that they, that they um, talked to farmers about. They collected some and brought them back to the Ethiopian Institute of um, Bi uh, Biodiversity so that they can be in a seed, and they're being put in seed banks, so that they can be uh, accessible, not just to individual farmers, obviously, or even communities, but also to breeders who might want to use them to uh, adapt other um, varieties in the context of climate ch changing climates.
That's one thing. There are other things that are changing as well, but that's one thing. Okay, so, oh, I already showed that one, sorry. Okay, move on. Yeah, thank you. Um, so just to summarize a bit, so these traditional species and varieties are really an important um, part of food, um, fodder, income throughout Ethiopia. And farmers' ratings of varieties really indicate significant differences in these varieties. So they'll tell you that this one is resistant to drought, this one is um, uh, t tolerant to this particular pest, or, or maybe not tolerant to that particular pest. They have that information, and that you know we can learn from that. And, and as it goes into a formal breeding system, that information could be really, really useful to the breeders. Okay, so that's the way we feel. That's why we think it's really important to be talking to the farmers. Um, what we do know is that legume diversity per household is quite low compared to those available within the community or especially at the, at the regional level. And most varieties are used by less than a third of their community. So conservation efforts really, we think, should be focused at least at the community level and then after that maybe at the zone level. Okay, next slide. So I'm going to switch now from those single varieties we were talking about. That was all varieties grown as a sole crop, the only crop in, in that particular field, and talk about mixtures of either varieties or species. But I'm going to talk about a very special kind of mixture. So I showed you pictures of polycultures where they had, you know, corn growing with beans, uh, with um, uh, other kinds of root crops growing in there. So a whole diversity of kinds of crops. These are really interesting, and I have to say, I'd never seen them until I went to Ethiopia. Um, but uh, I'll show you in a minute that they're more common than I thought they were. Um, farmers in northern Ethiopia plant mixtures of wheat and barley, which they call maslins, uh, mixed together. Okay, and that you know that's not the typical intercrop. Most intercrops are sort of taking advantage of the fact that oh. You grow corn with beans, the corn needs a lot of nitrogen, the beans are fixing nitrogen, so that's a really compatible system. You know, the, the needs aren't that different um, for wheat and, and, and barley, but um, the, the way that they grow them is to plant them, manage them, harvest, and, and eat them. <laughs> they use them uh, simultaneously as a mixture, which was something that I've never seen before. And over generations, uh, it seems that this simultaneous harvesting has led to synchronous maturity. So all these varieties are maturing at different rates. Well, it's one thing if you're going out and hand harvesting, well, even for hand harvesting, it's a pain. If, if your plants in your field are, are, are maturing at different rates and you have, to harv you have to go out and harvest for weeks in a row to make sure that you're catching everything before it shatters and falls to the ground, um, that's very painful and they have apparently selected for this simultaneous maturation across not just varieties of the same species, but the different species as well. And the proportion of the species and varieties shift in response to the variable weather um, conditions. So, you know, one year the wheats do better, one year the barleys do better, but you keep harvesting the, the, the crop as a crop, as a one crop, and continue to grow them that way. Next slide. And this is just an example um, that Alex uh, talked to this farmer who grows three wheats and four barley varieties in one field. And he, this is just such a beautiful, if you like grasses, I love grasses. This is such a beautiful photo with all those different colored barleys and wheats. Um, and the, these are, um, you know, what's nice is when different varieties actually show you their true colors by having different colors. You know, in my view, that makes it so much easier. You don't, have a, you don't need a genetic analysis or some very careful morphological analysis to figure that out. But, you know, this is what people are growing and using for their injera, for those... Um, well, actually, I have a photo. Yes, next. And here's the photo for any of you who have eaten Ethiopian food. This is a really classic um, picture of Ethiopian food. I see a few people nodding. Um, so you have all these legumes. You have some other vegetables on uh, here. Um, that's a legume. That's a lentil. Lentil, different, um, different legumes here and some other vegetables. And um, 
the injera, the, the flat pancake thing, is what you're actually eating it with. You know, you can think of it as a tortilla, but it's not really like a tortilla at all. But it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a bread. It's essentially the bread that they're using. And, and they, um, these cereal mixtures apparently make excellent injera. Now, we do think of teff as being the prime injera, but a lot of people don't have access to teff. So teff is harder to get, often more expensive. These mixtures, um, people can grow them and, and use them themselves. So um, the farmers, again, um, Alex um, McElvey interviewed about 160 uh, farmers, and they emphasized in particular the taste when they're used for injera, but they also emphasized that they planted these mixtures, particularly on sandy soils, um, drought-prone soils, low-fertility um, soils, because they did really well on those soils uh, compared to most crops that they might grow, including single-variety stands. And so the idea of the mixture, of course, is that you're confronting the mixture with a lot of different environmental conditions, and, um, and if, if it's the wrong environmental condition, one variety might not do well, but enough of the other varieties will do fine. That's kind of the nature of an intercrop as well, the same idea, that it, you buffer against complete yield loss, which is essential in these farming households, is that you can't lose all your yield. So if you lose a little of one variety, that's not really a, a big problem. Now, despite these advantages that we can see, um, extension agents have been promoting, just like the white bean that I showed you, they've also been promoting a bread wheat um, that is an improved bread wheat, and it has taken over in some areas, not, not much in other areas, and so it's kind of a, it's one of these questions about, obviously, genetic improvement in crops is a good thing, um, and it's very useful for protecting crops against pests and pathogens in some cases, but, uh, and, and so I'm all in favor of breeding and genetic, and, you know, genetic modification when you're searching for particular kinds of traits that you need. But the problem here is that you really need, we think you're going to need that diversity in the context of climate change, and it doesn't make sense to replace everything with one variety of bread wheat. Um, and I feel pretty confident of that. Um, so, Again, these colors are not coming out. So hopefully you can make out the geography here. But what I wanted to say is that as Alex and my, and my graduate student Anna have been working um, on, on trying to gather a lot of evidence about these wheat barley mixtures and other mixtures of similar um, species, they came through the literature, through a literature search, came to find all sorts of places where these um, maslins are being grown right now. So, for example, in Belarus, in the Caucasus, um, you know, they grow, well, they grow wheat and rye in, in, up in here, um, wheat and rice over here, which seems to be missing entirely. Um, oop, I didn't want that yet, but that's all right. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. My point is there are these that are, currently being grown regularly by people, and you can go there and you can find them. Um, and now, <laughs> thank you, um, when you search the literature, you find that they were grown everywhere. Well, not everywhere. Not in North America, as far as we can tell, um, because we didn't do wheat and barley in those days. Um, but they had, um, they had them throughout Europe, uh, Northern Africa, and parts of Asia. You can see that these these, and so these are particular kind of intercrop. They're two different species, but they share so many traits that it's really unique. It was something that most people haven't ever heard of, uh, including a lot of breeders, a lot of people who work in agroecology that are always talking about using intercrops. They'd never heard of this before. So it's actually, it's gotten really interesting to us. And, um, just want to put this up as sort of a summary for the so where these things sit, what we're calling confamilial, because they're in the same family. They're all poaceae, all gra in the grass family. So um, where they sit with respect to interfamilial um, polycultures, which would be things like maize and beans, and then at the other 
and our varietal mixtures, which I talked about uh, also, which is mixes of different varieties but of the same species. And what we're find, you know, what we think is that there's sort of a continuum with respect to several of these different traits that I've listed there. So there's um, crops can be grown for similar purposes. They have substitutability. Well, that's obviously going to be higher for bean for bean mixtures than it is uh, for maize and bean. They're, they're not going to be substitutable for the for the purpose that you want it for. Um, functional and nutritional complementarity is going to be better down here uh, for, for maize and beans. Um, ease of combined planting management and harvest is going to be best for the same crop, just different varieties of the same crop. But it turns out it can be quite good for this particular uh, confamilial mixture. Uh, ease of combined. Uh, differential responses to climate conditions actually is probably it's probably pretty broad for these confamilial mixtures somewhat less for varietal mixtures but even varietal mixtures have some advantages over just a pure stand of a single variety with respect to yield stability and then susceptibility to similar pests and diseases that is one thing about these like wheat and barley mixtures is there's some diseases that cross infect both wheat and barley so that would be a disadvantage um, compared to mixing that with a legume, for example, mixing one of them with a legume. But they still do quite well compared to um, a pure stand of, a of one thing. So these are the kinds of, you know, this is, this is my trip from, from biodiversity as an ecologist to biodiversity uh, in agriculture. Could I have the next slide, please? And I just want to summarize um, by saying that climate change uh, which we all know is increasing droughts and the frequency of extreme weather events um, is a challenge both to our conservation of these varieties, but, but it's also a challenge to us to do our, you know, do conserve these varieties to make those genetic resources, which I saw was misspelled, sorry about that, um, available for adaptation. And, Farmers' use of these varieties, they're choosing these varieties, they're selecting them for good reasons, and they can help us buffer uh, against changing climate and also potentially damage from increasing pests and pathogens, which is what we expect with rising temperatures in particular. So we are continuing, we really just started this project and then uh, the pandemic hit. And there is also some civil conflict in Ethiopia, if any of you are familiar with that. And so we've kind of had to shut down with our field work. And that's actually how all that literature survey got done, because nobody was going to the field and everybody was reading papers about it. And, and they really came up with an amazing amount of material um, that we have been able to use. But that's where we're planning in the future. We might have, we don't know what's going to happen with respect to going back to Ethiopia to do this work. But we're hoping to work on these confamilial mixtures and understand the potential um, of these to be helpful as we move uh, more directly into climate, uh, changing climate. And I should stop and take questions. I know. We've got, uh, Leighton has a microphone, he'll run um, uh, to those of you who have questions. So if you have questions, please raise your hand and Dr. Power will call on you. Don't hold back. <laughs> okay, so we know that just, you know, even the, the layperson knows that we're losing varieties at alarming rates the world over, for example. There used to be 30,000 varieties of potatoes, and now there's, there's much, much less, yep. even in regions that grow and where they, they originally came from in South America. So we know this. We know logically that we're losing our varieties. We know that we're losing plant diversity. But yet we see little connection to policy, either whether we're talking regionally, uh, at the country level, and certainly even in, international. So what does someone like yourself who, who sees this on the ground, what do you suggest that we begin the conversations around so that we can help preserve this kind of variety that we need to survive? It's not just nice to have 
corn in 15, 20 colors. It's a matter of our survival long term. Yeah, it's a challenge. I'm not going to deny that. I think that the community seed banks that are being developed in a number of places now are one way, but they're, you know, they have limitations too, in part because they're underfunded typically. So, um, you know, one of the things about a seed bank that people forget about is that if you put it in, you can't just leave it there. Uh, you have to bring it out and grow it out periodically. Uh, and so you have to be able to do that in order to maintain what's in there. It, you know, eventually it degrades. It may take a while if you have good storage. A lot of places in a community seed bank aren't going to have really good cold storage for keeping these seeds. And so there is this nature of seed banks that are difficult. You know, in a sense, what we're proposing here with what saying community level conservation is also um, in, you know in situ conservation so seed banks we call ex situ conservation because it's taken away and put somewhere uh, in situ is is farmers actually maintaining these and you know there's been talk and it's it's been around for a while um, to pay farmers to keep those varieties you know to actually provide some subsidies so that farmers can continue to invest in, in the things they want to grow, but maybe, you know, are being pressured by other forces to grow something more that yields better, for example. And so that is another thing. But, you know, on a worldwide, on a global scale, the CGIR centers are one place. These are the um, crop, I can't remember what, crop, anyway, the, the, um, the, the crop centers that you find distributed around the world, they, they get money from, they have in the past gotten money from the UN, from um, uh, the World Bank in particular. Uh, I think, I can't remember if the Gates Foundation is now putting some money into these centers. They're well established. They all, pretty much all have seed banks of different crops. So that would be one way of trying to do it. Of course, most nations have seed banks. The problem is just um, how good are they? Are they keeping things in good condition? All those kinds of things. But you know, we have our, our wheat, I'm pretty sure this is true, that our wheat is out in Pullman, Washington, you know, our seed bank for, for wheats. I, correct me if anybody knows I'm wrong about that, but I think that's where it is. Um, and, and we have a whole series of seed banks in the U.S. that where we maintain the crops that we think are important. Um, but, of course, that's not the whole world worth of crops. And so, you know, we, we really do need a better uh, system to support it and it seems like it has to come through something like the UN, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN to really make this happen. And, but money, you know, money. Um, pandemic, money, yeah. Thanks. Just a, a follow-up. I'm wondering if you can elaborate on what the traditional ecological knowledge systems might be at these community levels that are maintaining that diversity in the varieties. Is it um, a matter of sort of recirculating knowledge? Is it about a few key elders in the community who are your primary seed savers? Like, do we know mm -hmm. how those mechanisms, in the absence of seed banks, have, have been or had been maintained? Yeah. I mean, there are these elders, which is what we tried to find out to talk to for, as our key informants, that are um, they're retainers of knowledge and somewhat of seed, but not entirely. But what we find is that in these communities, there's a lot of seed exchange. That doesn't mean you won't lose some, because if nobody thinks, oh, that's really what I want to grow right now. But when you ask people where they get their seed, uh, a lot of them get it from neighbors. You know, you saw this growing in their field. Oh, wow, that looked really good last year. I think, you know, I would like some of that seed. And so they do a lot of seed sharing. Uh, that's, that's probably not a completely reliable way to just keep seed in the system. Um, they also, though, they get a lot of their seeds from markets. So people go to the market, they take their seed to market, and then they buy seed at the interesting seed from the market. So there's sort of a whole dynamic relationship um, with seed production and seed sales the question is, you know, how do, how do we even see what we're losing by not having something sort of more structurally secure in a way to do? 
And I don't really have a good example. I mean, again, these, key, these um, community leaders who have a lot of knowledge and do, do retain uh, varieties, but I don't think, you can't count on them to do everything <laughs> for the community. Um, so, you know, so, so far there's still a lot of diversity. Do I know that that's going to continue based on the processes that are in place right now? I don't know. Um, I'm curious to know if you think the consumption of like a wider variety of foods um, contributes to like healthier populations, like especially compared to that with the U.S., who we know is not typically seen as a healthy nation, who also kind of eats just a low variety of crops. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting. We were ha I was having this, somebody commented today about how when they were growing up, they could never get avocados. I can't remember who it was, you know, and now you can get avocados everywhere, you know. So actually, we have access to an amazing diversity of crops, and partly it's because we're getting them in the off season as well as the season. It used to be that good fresh fruit you could only get in the summer. I mean, when I was, okay. Well, I'm not going to talk about when I was growing up. That was too long ago. But in any case, there, there are these things that have changed. So we do have access to, you know, yucca in the supermarket. You can buy yucca anywhere now, or maybe not anywhere, but you can buy it most places. Um, that was certainly not possible. So, you know, this globalization of food, I feel like I've benefited from it because I get to eat things that I never got to eat when I was a kid. But it does... You know, with globalization often comes homogenization, and that can be a problem if you're just going to have everybody eating the same thing. And one of the indicators of that is um, how junk food travels and how, you know, populations that never had high rates of obesity now have high rates of obesity, usually be, not because of... Um, you know, mostly because it's not good quality food there, it's being highly processed or other kinds of things, whereas I feel like we're getting the benefits of this globalization by getting all these fruits and vegetables that we didn't get before, but it's up to us whether we're going to eat those or we're going to eat junk food, which we have plenty of it available. I don't think I really answered your question. <laughs> Earlier today, Linda Prokopi used the term co-production to describe the practice of doing research with and for local communities. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could comment on co-production as a research methodology. Obviously, it's important to you. I see that you're not only working with indigenous farmers, but also with a crew of Ethiopian collaborators. So could you talk about why you do that, and does it intersect with your interest in environmental justice? Yeah, I mean, I couldn't possibly work in Ethiopia without Ethiopian colleagues. I mean, it wouldn't make any sense, you know. I don't have the knowledge. I mean, these are the people that, you know, that have the knowledge base, especially a few of them have incredible knowledge base about, about you know, about everything <laughs> relating to this, these topics. And so... Uh, you know, I just can't possibly imagine functioning without those kinds of collaborations. It wouldn't be something that I would, I would be, I would feel like I was, um, you know, I want to be able to contribute, but, uh, you know, I have to, I have to make sure that I'm understanding what the actual situation is, and I, you know, especially with the 86 language problem, that's a problem. <laughs> um, so, but in terms of the idea of co production of the research with farmers, we're, that is one of the bases of this project. And the people, the Ethiopian partners, um, particularly uh, Zemere Asfa is, an, is a very distinguished older ethnobotanist. He's been doing this kind of work for a very long time um, from Addis Ababa. And, and he, he kind of always keeps us real about what we're talking about, you know, is some of the other uh, Ethiopians are, you know, some of them have been trained in Belgium and come back with big ideas about how to do things, but all of them have this fundamental interest in both um, learning from farmers uh, and also um, uh, 
contributing back to farmers. So that is really the basis of how the project, this project has worked. And I, I assume that that will work the same as we move into the, the wheat barley project as well, because people, you know, they, they feel really deeply about Ethiopia and how smallholders can benefit from changes or, or at least not be um, disadvantaged by all the changes that are occurring. And so that, you know, it's just a goal. I, f I feel like, you know, we co-produced, it's true, that our co-production took place um, with these university partners and a few other partners um, as well. But in going out and talking to farmers, um, they are also directing us uh, as to what's important. And so it is the topics that we follow up on are ones that the farmers tell us are important to them. And that's what we try to do. Just following up on that, a lot of your narrative is about how the indigenous knowledge has kind of given them resilience against certain mm -hmm. types of climate changes and things. Mm -hmm. To what extent is this just a matter of following what the farmers already know, or are there things that need to be built on on what the indigenous knowledge already knows? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. Like, what the heck do the scientists have to contribute to this? I mean, part of it is, I think, you know, we can actually try to identify, you know, they say that this trait is important to them, uh, and then we can try and identify what's causing that trait and be able to build it into other varieties which might have other good, you know, traits, but they don't have all the good traits. And so there are ways that you can take the knowledge that they have and they tell us about uh, and, and then take it to the breeders and other people who are really exploring these traits uh, and and try to Im actually improve the agricultural system. So, yeah, it's not just about. You know, I mean, some people would are you know would sort of say, oh, you're just leaving them in underdevelopment. Well, I don't really feel that that's true if it's working for them. But what we anticipate is the challenges of climate change, and other kinds of challenges like globalization challenges and uh, economic challenges that that have you know economic changes and trade challenges of trade that, you know, drive them in other directions, the more that we can um, help them adapt to those changes, which they're not going to be able to, you know, prevent, and still retain some of the positive aspects of what they have been doing, I feel like it's a, it's co-production, you know, it's, it's basically trying to use um, both scientific knowledge and being able to forecast things about climate change. Um, and use their knowledge uh, about, you know, what's culturally acceptable, what's, um, what's valuable to them as farmers, how it affects their work day. You know, again, we've actually asked them a lot of questions about, you know, what's difficult? Um, how do you, you know, how do you, do you have to treat this one differently than others, you know, when we talk about the different varieties? So I, I feel like we're, what we're trying to do is integrate these two knowledge spheres in a way that in the, the result is to feed it back to farmers and to the policy of the, you know, policy makers at probably not the highest government levels at this point, but at lower government levels like within the district that, you know, might be able to change some things and change, for example, access to um, uh, um, inputs, for example, if they seem like they're a good idea in that case. So I feel like it's a, it's a good question because it's a hard question. Uh, but I feel like um, by working with farmers, it's not, you know, it is, it, it can feel like, oh, well, you know, you just want to go out and find out what they're doing and, and take it away and talk about it, but not actually do anything for the farmers. And I think we're trying to have that not be the case. Um, and one of the things that the universities are doing, besides training graduate students in, in country, which I think is always helpful, um, but they're also, um, they have these, these are all agricultural, these are land grant universities, sort of. Um, they're, they're all agricultural universities and they're, and they have these farmer um, days where all the farmers come and look at all the seeds that are available. And so one thing that the, just like the seed exchanges that happen in communities, they also bring farmers in 
to the university and, and they can exchange seed there. So they do have more opportunities and they talk to other farmers at these. So they, they talk to other farmers that are growing this and the other farmer can tell them this is, you know, this is um, what I value about this and they might try it. So I, I think that um, the process as it has been working does provide some benefits for farmers and, and it might help them buffer against the changes that they're going to experience no matter what. Hi, Dr. Power. So you talked a lot about how cover cropping and intercropping can really help to increase and preserve biodiversity in these farming ecosystems. And I know that these types of practices can also help reduce the pollution of waterways, mm -hmm. especially for cover cropping. So I was wondering if you might be able to speak to how these practices can help agroecosystems and food production to be more resilient to climate change. I think you just said it, didn't you? <laughs> I think it was a good job. Um, yeah, you know, we're not, we're not dealing with a lot of um, nitrogenous fertilizers in Ethiopia in the communities we're working with, but absolutely uh, there are lots of ways that we could improve our, our agricultural systems by, inc by incorporating more diversity. I mean, we, you know, the Midwest has always had rotations, soybean, corn rotations. So that's, that's a good thing, you know. Um, even if the, some of the corn pests have learned how to wait out the, everybody knows this story, right? They, they wait out the year with the soybeans and then don't emerge until the year that the corn comes back. So uh, organisms are very responsive to changes we make in our, in our um, agricultural systems uh, and involved to overcome them. But absolutely, um, when we think about pollution kinds of questions, we do need to make these systems more productive without using as much fertilizer and certainly using it more carefully so that we're not just losing it from the system because what a waste for everybody. Farmers paying for it and it's just causing pollution that has to be cleaned up somewhere else. So cover crops, green manures, all sorts of ways of making the system require less nitrogen is clearly beneficial. Leighton's getting his exercise. <laughs> I may have missed this, but uh, why Ethiopia? You know, <clears throat> I guess I didn't really talk about how this project started. Um, I had never been to Ethiopia when, the pro when I kind of got um, persuaded to get involved in this project. Uh, and I'd never worked, I'd worked a little bit in Kenya on a, on a pathogen of, of maize, but that was it. That was my African experience entirely. And um, the, the, um, the person I identified, Morgan Ruel, who's the first person under postdocs there because he, had a postdoc with me. As a graduate student, he worked in Ethiopia. And he um, had made a contact over there um, with one of the faculty, with uh, actually um, Zemere Asfa at Addis Ababa University. And, and uh, Zemere actually was on his dissertation committee. And so we got to know, I was also on his committee, we got to know Zemede, and this really evolved out of that context. So it was, a, it was a graduate student that did it, and he became interested. I don't know how he became interested in Ethiopia originally, actually. I'm not quite sure how he did, but he was the one that started the process and then has continued to work and has been you know, an amazing partner throughout, even though he's now off as a faculty member elsewhere. So yeah, that's how it happened for me, and it, that's an odd way for it to happen. Um, but um, because usually you sort of choose, but I'd worked mostly in Latin America and somewhat in Southeast Asia. I had never worked very much at all in, in Africa and this was, you know, he persuaded me it would be interesting to do it and once I met the, the partners that we brought together, I realized it was just a great group to work with and so. 
Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And let's give Dr. Powers a big round of applause. And thanks again.